Hello and welcome to another episode of Back Nine Report with our good friend Mike May. Mike, how you doing today? You got home from uh, from Midland, Michigan. You're back in Florida where it's like 120 degrees or something, right? I think it's only 110. So, you know, what's 10 degrees? Hey, um, we had a big tournament last weekend and we want to talk just a little bit about the Open Championship. Um, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it, but uh, Brian Harmon, who knew? Here we got a guy joined the tour in 2012. So, you know, over 10 years, 11 years on tour, always been very steady, very consistent. Um, you know, a guy that uh, makes a lot of money. He's made $33 million in his career so far, just in prize money. That's not including all the sponsorship money he's, he's earned. He's played in 340 events, made 235 cuts. That's that's pretty good, 67% or so. Uh, that's, that's pretty good for making cuts. Um, he was the most consistent in the field last week, Mike. Fairways, greens, and putting. His putting and chipping were amazing. Um, what do you want to say? What can you say about Brian Harmon at the Open Championship? Well, it just speaks to the depth of, of men's professional golf. Uh, you know, nobody expected Brian Harmon to contend, let alone win. And he uh, did exactly the opposite. And it just goes to show you, when you put – a big tournament like that on a course that's not necessarily geared to the bombers, those who hit a ton off the tee. Uh, as Tiger demonstrated when he won at Royal Liverpool about 17 years ago, he didn't use a, he only used driving irons. Um, it takes precision. And, uh, you know, Brian, um, when I think of Brian Harmon, I think of him back in 2017 when he contended at the U.S. Open where Brooks Kepka broke through. So Brian's had his name on the leaderboard. Uh, a number of times, more on Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays, not so much Sundays, but uh, he uh, realized that he needed to um, capitalize, and uh, he didn't wilt. A little bit of a throwback, Brian Harmon is. Uh, you know, we think back, uh, guys like uh, Ben Hogan, you know, probably 5'8", five, 5'9", five, five, probably 5'7", five, somewhere along 5'8", along in there. Brian Harmon, again, 5'7", not the tallest guy in the world, but man, he's so consistent. He was just striping that driver for pretty much all the week. And the big story at Royal Liverpool was keep it out of the uh, the, the bunkers, out of those uh, pot bunkers and uh, those fairway bunkers. And he did that. I think he only hit one bunker all week, uh, which was, you know, led the field by a wide margin. Um, so that just goes back to that consistency, consistency thing. Uh, really happy for Brian. He's been around a long time and, and a really good player. And this kind of validates his career. No matter what happens, he's got that major victory now. So good for him. I um, want to talk a little bit about Rory McIlroy. He is just a conundrum, man. What what do we think of this guy? Um, he's just so inconsistent. Uh, we see him play at the Scottish and he looks like he's got everything put together. He's playing well. He's, you know, in the system. And then he goes over to Royal Liverpool and can't hit a wedge, can't make a putt, uh, hitting the ball over the lot. Um, you know, I, I don't – does he put too much pressure on himself? What's going on with Rory? You got any thoughts on that? Well, I, I go back to the first round. When the day began, Rory was tied for the lead because everybody was at level par. By the time he teed off, though, on that Thursday afternoon, he was already five shots behind. And I think he may have been guilty of pressing – from the get-go and not just letting his game go. Uh, you and I talked earlier, he's very inconsistent on his wedge play, which doesn't make matters uh, any easier. But uh, I think he uh, may be guilty of reading the headlines uh, and uh, reading all these stories about him and realize he's got to live up to what people uh, predict. And I think if he just lets his game do its talking, uh, he was probably less concerned about headlines 10 years ago than he is now. Um, He's one of the leading players in the world on and off the course. And, and he probably has an internal pressure to win another open and um, he still has time, but he's had an opportunity last year that just didn't cash in. And this year he just didn't make enough putts. Yeah. I, you know, and this is a course he's won on before, right? Uh, so he should, and then he won last week at the Scottish the week before. So, you know, we pretty high expectations for Rory going in here. Now, you've got to beat this field of 144 guys. You know, it's not like playing baseball or, you know, some other two, you don't, you don't, you're just not playing the team in front of you. You got to beat 143 guys uh, that are also in the field. So it's not an easy task, no question about it. And the body changes and situation changes and all that kind of thing. But 
I, I you know, I, we, you mentioned it is a wedge play. And I, I just think I've been watching Rory a lot this year. And where his game is letting him down is on his wedges. His putting is not great, but it's it's okay in flashes. With, that's the way with everybody. Uh, when they're not playing good, their putting is not as good. But Rory, his wedge play, yes, he hit some good wedges, but too often he's hitting the wedge from 100 and inside, you know, 120 yards, inside 150 yards. He's hitting it uh, 30 feet away, or he's missing the green, or he's hitting in a spot where it ends up rolling off the green, especially those greens that were a Liverpool were humped and there were limited hitting areas there. They had roll offs on the sides. Um, so that was easy to do. But when you're a, a level player that Rory is, you've got to be way more consistent with your iron play. And uh, he's got to do something about that. Cause I think that's, what's really holding him back. It looks like to me. So think, the next, go ahead, Mike, you want to say. When you're, when you're inconsistent in your wedge play, then you feel as if off the tee, you have to be that much more perfect. And, and uh, so that puts some pressure on the driving game to be in the, the right position, the right distance to the green. And then when you don't, um, uh, get as close as you think you should, then you've got pressure on that putting green to um, to make that putt, which in the case may lead you to push it too far past, at least a three putt. So uh, the, the wedge game, I think, does have an impact elsewhere, and that impacts the overall score. Yeah, and Rory's just too good of a player. He's got to figure this out. I, I still look for Rory to go on a run and win, like in two or three years, win like four majors like one a year or a couple in one year. I, I, he's that good of a player. I mean, he's a guy that could do the Grand Slam or win four in a row. He's the guy that could do that, except I just don't think he's consistent enough. He doesn't stay focused, and he doesn't play the shot that's presented sometimes. Sometimes he tries to force a little bit. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see. But Roy's a great player. has been for a long, long time and always fun to watch. But uh, he does have some areas in the game that needs to be shorn up a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about uh, John Rahm. Uh, Rahm fired at 63 on Saturday, was magnificent. He was in total control. I really thought he would make more of a charge on Sunday, but it, it just didn't happen for him, Mike. Uh, brilliant round on Saturday, a uh, record for uh, uh, an open at Royal Liverpool with his, with his 63. I was watching him Thursday and Friday, and he was hovering around par, and they would get over par. And I was a little concerned about him making the cut, but uh, I, I hate to use a cliche, but there's no give up in that uh, – Bulldog Terrier mentality of John Rahm, and uh, he um, he continues to. Of course, he finished with a, a birdie on 18 on Sunday, so he never gave up and battled to the very end. Another guy, kind of a blast from the past, that's really been making his name. So we've seen Roy F Ricky Fowler do a good job over the last uh, 18 months, getting back in contention, finally winning in Detroit. We, you know, Ricky was one of the favorites going in here, and he played well. He made the cut, but it, you know, he wasn't among the leaders really. But the other guy I want to talk about, Jason Day, uh, and I don't know if you know this, Mike, but he does live in Ohio. I don't, you know, I didn't know if you know that. I'm just, but just, I'm just saying, uh, he had a he had a great another great tournament. He finished tied for runner up with John Rahm and with Sepp Straka. Uh, so, what do you think about Jason Day's uh, return to uh, world class play? Uh, he's been trending that direction for about a year, and I uh, I've been waiting for him to sort of have a, a reemergence. He's only about 35, 36, so he's still young enough to add to his one PGA championship that he had a few years ago, a dynamic player, uh, incredible uh, speed on his swing. Uh, he can hit it a ton. He's a good putter. His biggest issue really has been uh, uh, injuries. And uh, I know he lost his mother in, in recent years. And, and uh, so those things do play on you, but I think Jason is an, when he's healthy, he can beat anyone. Jeff Straka and Brian Harmon probably just locked in appearances in the Ryder Cup that's coming at the end of September. Straka, of course, for Europe and Harmon for Zach Johnson's U.S. team. We talked about that a little bit. Do you think these will make good additions to the Ryder Cup? Definitely Sepp Straka. Um, he's, he's, he won the Honda Classic, which is definitely one of the more difficult uh, venues to win on uh, here in the PGA Tour. And uh, Brian um, will be uh, an excellent addition to the team and by golly, if you win the Open Championship, you deserve to get on that uh, Ryder Cup team. And he, um, he's got a, a competitive mentality. Maybe uh, it's because of his short stature. He feels if he's got to fight a little harder, try a little harder uh, to stay up with these taller, bigger guys. Um, but I'll be shocked if we don't have both those players on their respective teams. 
Brian Harmon probably would make a really good foursomes partner for someone. Uh, also, uh, you know, he's a bulldog in singles, so he'd be a good singles player. So I look for him to play in foursomes and, of course, and everybody plays singles. But uh, I, I look for him to to be a good uh, a good Ryder Cup uh, teammate, actually. I, I And I think everybody's kind of happy that he's getting this finally done. He's been really close on the past couple of international teams, the President's Cup and Ryder Cup teams, just hasn't quite made it. But uh, this should do it for him and, and uh, happy for him. Uh, Mike, any other comments about the uh, the Open Championship before we wrap up this short recap? Uh, one final comment about the winner. Um, I heard on the broadcast uh, on NBC that late in the round or maybe early in the round, they said that Harmon's last 44 putts at the Open from 10 feet and in all found the hole. 44 straight putts from less than 10 feet. Variety of angles, situations. Uh, I don't think I could go on a green and, and make 10 in a row from inside 10 feet. Now, some were tappings, but when you get to be an 8, 10 footer and you make 44 of those distances, impressive. So his short game was spot on and he was a deserving winner. Yeah, his chipping and putting were exceptional all week. Saturday, he made putts to save par. I probably what four of them, I think, in that round. Uh, and a couple of them were pretty long. I'm talking like 15 over, maybe 20 feet. Uh, so he had a really great week putting, and he just seemed really in control. Uh, he made a great putt in the last hole uh, at the 72nd hole to save par. So, uh, yeah, it's it was a really fine uh, performance by Brian Harmon. We're really happy for him and, and look for him to do uh, great things going forward. Mike, thanks a lot for joining us on Back Nine Report. You're welcome.